This is 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacific Radio Network, streaming live at stream.wbai.org. We are very happy to have with us live today nuclear expert, nuclear engineer, plant operator, and expert witness Arnie Gunderson of Fair Winds Associates. And uh, today we're going to do a roundup of some of the clear and present dangers of nuclear facilities in the United States of America. We'll also have a roundup of what is happening with the doomed nuclear plant complex in Japan known as Fukushima. Welcome back, Arnie. Hi, Robert. Thanks for having me. And I'd like to congratulate you on your recent trip and tour and press uh, conference in Japan with the release of your new book on the real dangers of Fukushima. How did, how did that go? Um, well, the, the, the tour was terrific. Um, I mean, it was, um, the Japanese are such, such wonderful, wonderful people. Um, there's, um, uh, it started with a two, two hour presentation at the Japanese press club and, and, uh, I did get to visit a nuclear plant, not, not Fukushima, but, uh, Hamoaka, which is, um, was, um, I'll tell you, the visitor center was gorgeous. The, <laughs> um, they had to spend a hundred million dollars on their visitor center to promote nuclear power. Well, um, that is not the only place where there are the dangers of cracked containments, the dangers of inadvertent release of radioactive materials, and uh, insufficient planning for various emergencies that may occur. And we've not had as much of a chance to speak about the domestic dangers. And uh, around this time, nearly a year ago, we were speaking about Fort Calhoun in Omaha and the risks that that plant posed in the face of what last year was a record level of flooding, and the plant almost got uh, flooded, and in fact there was seepage of water into the basement. But uh, apparently that is not the only problem with uh, the facilities in Nebraska. Among the problems that we are aware of is that there has been a failure or an incomplete uh, uh, maintenance or upkeep of the siren and warning facilities and other dangers, but that may be the least of it. What is the latest you know about uh, Nebraska, Arnie? Um, yeah, it's a long litany. Um, yes, we were on about a year ago talking about the floods, and um, um, well, let's give the NRC one pat on the back before we, uh, we, we lower our aim a little lower. But uh, they did, uh, uh, back in '09, they did force Fort Calhoun to... Uh, do some flood enhancements. Had they not done that, they, uh, the plant uh, likely would have um, would have melted down. So I think the uh, the NRC um, was proactive in, in forcing Fort Calhoun to do some work back in '09. Uh, okay, so now let's name a little lower. The um, uh, while we were uh, while the plant was flooded, uh, they there there were leaks through penetrations um, which we were unaware of last year. It had to be, but. Uh, the basement areas were getting uh, taking in water, uh, but I, I think you recall we had a long discussion about the fire. They had a fire that knocked out the uh, spent fuel pool cooling for 90, 90 minutes. Um, just this week, they got a red finding, and um, that's as bad as it gets, uh, short of shutting a plant down, um, and uh, as a result of the the, the fire. Um, by the way, the NRC has only shut one plant down in 30 years, and that was because the resident inspector walked in and found the five operators asleep in the control room at the same time. So I don't think Fort Calhoun's going to get, get shut down for a mere fire. They, um, uh, but, but in addition to the fire knocking out the spent fuel pool cooling, the NRC determined that had there been an accident going on, it would have knocked out the accident cooling as well. Um, and, and that's just part of this big puzzle. That's, the red finding was specifically aimed at that. But now Fort Calhoun's been down for more than a year, and it's, um, uh, it's got management problems, severe management problems that uh, um, have not been identified by the NRC over the last year or two, and it's not been identified by uh, INPO, which is the Institute for Nuclear Preparedness, the, uh, um, the, the industry's watchdog group. So, you know, the, the question is, how could it get this bad with all that oversight? You know, we've got NRC inspectors, we've got INPO inspectors, we've got people in the plant, and it looks like they'll be um, down for at least 18 months when they shake out their management problems, the fire. Um, God, there's a, there's a litany of problems there, in addition to the fact that the plant flooded and the foundations got soggy. Arnie Gunderson, 
One of the characteristics of nuclear plants is that they need millions and millions of gallons of water per day in order to maintain cooling. And the cooling mechanism of the Fort Calhoun and the other plant in Nebraska, they're on the Missouri River. Mm -hmm. And can you tell us what parameters there are of possible radiation release into the river? Well, we talked about that last year, and I kept saying, forget the containment, forget the big building. Look at that little, the little building on the water, which was completely surrounded by, uh, by water. <clears throat> and it's interesting, in the last year, the NRC has finally recognized that um, uh, that that is likely the single biggest weakness in any nuclear plant. And that's the intake structure, and within the intake structure is something called the service water pumps. And they're the thing that, that actually cool the diesels and they cool the nuclear core. Um, and they're sitting right on the water with no protection whatsoever. So um, the, we, we call it the loss of the ultimate heat sink. And the emphasis is on ultimate. This, um, uh, if you lose it, there is no alternative. Um, we had an example last summer where a, um, a Norwegian sailboat sailed into Boston Harbor. Its motor failed and the crew saw these lights on the horizon. It was at night. And they, they floated over and dropped anchor. And in the morning, when the sun came up, they, uh, they realized they were 30 feet away from the intake structure at the Pilgrim nuclear plant. And um, the guards realized that, oh, my God, we've got this huge boat 30 feet away from our intake structure. If instead of law-abiding Norwegians, we had had um, you know, Tim McVeigh in that sailboat, um, we likely would have had a loss of the ultimate heat sink. You could, these, uh, because those structures, whether through an act of terror or an act of God, are the, uh, the most vulnerable part of a nuclear plant. The operation of a nuclear power plant is so dependent on the cooling and emergency core cooling system and the spent fuel storage cooling system. It's almost like a blowtorch with the batteries not included for the safety system because of the uh, possibility of the failure. A nuclear plant actually has to subscribe to electricity from somewhere else or depend on emergency generators. Can you tell us how that vulnerability touches all nuclear power plants, not to mention the possibility of solar storm outages? Well, there's a, a euphemism in the nuclear industry that there's been a safe shutdown. And uh, routinely when a plant shuts down, you'll hear the NRC say that uh, the plant is safely shut down. Um, what that means is the control rods fall in and the chain reaction stops. But that doesn't mean that the heat stops. And, and that's where the, the and I, there's the rub. Um, the, um, because the chain reaction has gone on, now instead of a uranium atom, you've got pieces that are also radioactive. And as they decay away, they give off a lot of heat. At the beginning, almost 8%, and then gradually over time down to 1% and, and, and less. But they have to be cooled even after the chain reaction stops. And, of course, that's what happened at, at, um, at uh, Fukushima. It was that um, uh, even though the, the reactor scrammed, uh, we're, we're certain that the control rods fell in, um, they still had to be cooled externally. And they have to be cooled for years, um, at least four or five years, before you, have to, before you can basically assume that they can be cooled in air. So, um, yeah, the, the euphemism of a safe shutdown just means that 95% of the heat is, is dissipated. But, you know, let's look at a plant like um, Indian Point, which has more than uh, about 33, 3.5 million horsepower inside this little contain, containment. Well, 5% of that is still an awful lot of horses. You know, it's, I'm doing quick math in my head here, but, you know, 200,000 horses inside that little building that have to be cooled. Um, and uh, that's where the weakness is, is removing that heat for an extended period of time, not just an hour or two, but for, for days and years. There are other nuclear problems across the United States. And for our listeners uh, with uh, locations or contacts in California, there's uh, yet another kind of problem involving the heat exchange from the hot water of the nuclear reaction and its uh, uh, downshifting uh, into steam for the turning of the turbines. And I understand that that is a problem at San Onofre. What do you know about that? Um, yeah, the the uh, San Onofre plants are um, started up in uh, '83 and '84, 
And over time, the heat exchangers uh, called called steam generators um, began to break, and that's that has become the, sort of the rule in this industry. Um, Almost like, you know, eventually when you drive your car long enough, you've got to replace the, the radiator. Um, it's the same thing in the nuclear plant. You've got to replace these steam generators. Well, Southern California Edison's uh, management decided that they weren't just going to replace these steam generators, but that they were going to make them with more tubes inside, and they were going to, and that forced a whole series of design modifications. So they put these new hyped, uh, supercharged um, steam generators in, uh, two years ago, and um, and they failed. Um, just in January, one actually blew some tubes, and uh, the other one, when they went in to look, had tubes that were at 30% worn already, and the plant's only, this, this piece, this component, is only two years old. So um, the plant's down, has been down since January, and likely will be down at least part of the summer. Um, because nobody can figure out how this happened, and once you find out how it happened, nobody can figure out how to prevent it from uh, from getting any worse uh, moving into the future. You know, that's a that's a very crowded plant site. For anybody who's ever been there, it's only a couple hundred feet wide, and it's right on the Pacific on one side, and Route 5 runs right, I-5 runs right down from San Diego up to L.A., right on the other side of the plant. And Within um, it's it's second only to Indian Point as far as population density. Um, you know, there's a couple of this um, eight million people within 26 miles of Indian Point, and there's about eight million within 50 miles of um, of San Onofre. So, if one of these pipes were to burst um, and uh, and cascade, it's something we call a steam generator tube ruptures. Um, it could, you know, shut down I-5 and cause uh, evacuation. So it's important to get it right. It's important to take your time and figure out what the heck caused these tubes to break so so prematurely. In um, many cases, malfunctions in the steam generators are referred to by the industry as the non-nuclear part <laughs> of the power plant. Is that an accurate characterization? Well, it's the uh, it's the divider between the nuclear part and the non-nuclear part. So, you know, like when the, uh, the, the tube that failed um, just began to leak, uh, and the leak was significant enough that they picked it up on their radiation monitors and shut the plant down. <clears throat> Had they not picked it up, the tube would have literally been cut by the, by the pinhole because the water pressure is uh, over 1,000 pounds per square inch, and it doesn't take long before a, a little hole gets real big real fast. So what happens in, 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 in these heat exchangers is that the radioactive water is supposed to be on one side and the clean water is supposed to be on the other. So this failure allows the containment to be breached. It allows the radioactive material to cross out of the containment, and it can't be isolated, uh, which, is, which is part of the problem. Arnie Gunderson is with Fairwinds Associates. And, Arnie, I know that you have uh, for quite some time, for many years, been concerned about the integrity of containment uh, vessels and uh, the possibility of there being uh, ruptures or cracks in uh, such facilities. And uh, there is another plant that has a very serious problem of this uh, form at Crystal River, is there not? Yeah, uh, Progress Energy is, uh, has problems in Florida. Um, they were building the Levy County units, and they were scheduled to go online in 2016 for $5 million, and now they're 20. 26 for 25 billion, so it's gone up fivefold on the estimate and taken 10 more years to build. So, but but on top of that, they have an operating unit called Crystal River, and um, they were going to replace the steam generators on Crystal River, just like just like at the uh, San Onofre, they, and they decided that they were going to do it themselves. Um, they didn't need experts. They had, um, uh, but it's almost like you know having slept at a uh, Holiday Inn Express or something like that. So they felt that they were qualified. So they decided they were going to do it themselves to save about twenty million dollars and cut a hole in this uh, containment. Now the hole is about twenty-eight feet in diameter and about four feet thick, solid concrete and steel. And when they cut it, they noticed this crack, and uh, they said, "Whoops, this is not good." And the crack turned out to be sixty feet long and more than 20 feet wide. And it's almost like the Firestone tires becoming delaminated. It was a, it was a crack like that. So, it's not something you can fix with crazy glue. No. <laughs> no, absolutely. So they, um, this is in, in 09. 
And now, about 18 months later, they brought in every expert under the sun, and they tried to fix it with crazy glue. They, they made repairs um, to the crack, and then they started to tighten it back up, and it cracked somewhere else. And then they said, oh, my God, and they had to shut down again. And while they were shut down again, it cracked in a third place. Um, so it looks like they'll be down for five years at least before they fix these cracks. And... Um, no, the question is, why don't they just knock it down and start fresh? And the, the problem is, the, um, if the building is still there and you try to put the crazy glue on while the building's still there, the NRC will protect you and you don't have to go out for a new license. But if they knock the building down and start fresh, at that point the NRC starts the licensing clock up again and they are terrified to try to relicense the plant. So it's 30, oh, 33 or 34 years old will be shut down for five years, and it's already applying for a 20-year license extension. Um, but um, the, the people getting rich right now are the lawyers because there's um, enormous um, damage claims. Uh, Crystal River is saying, well, it's an act of God, and um, we couldn't have foreseen this crack. And um, uh, they're trying to go after their insurance carrier for $2 billion to repair it. So to save $20 million bucks, they um, it, it, it's cost somebody, likely the ratepayers in Florida, $2 billion to fix it. One could say that nuclear is whack because of reactors on crack, <laughs> but we won't. <laughs> like How, <laughs> however, uh, more seriously, what do you suspect is the hidden danger of embrittlement, crackage, and other maladies that occur with materials over long periods of time, particularly with nuclear reactors now being licensed well beyond their intended lifespan? Uh, boy, that's a great question. You know, the, the, um, we have this thing called the bathtub curve in, in uh, reliability engineering. And if you cut a bathtub in half and you start on the top of one side, that's unreliable. When you get something new, it's unreliable. But very quickly, it becomes very reliable. A new car or whatever, you shake the bugs out in a month or two. So now you're down at the bottom of the bathtub. And you go a long time on a nice flat bottom of the bathtub. But eventually you hit the other side and you gradually start to go up the bathtub curve again. Um, and that's an aging phenomenon. That's it's actually a technical term, the bathtub curve. And it's, um, it's an aging phenomenon. And the nuclear industry seems to forget that. Um, you know, the, the average nuclear plant in America now is uh, more than 30 years old. And they were only designed for 40 so what they're suggesting is that, well, we can just kind of cut this bathtub in half and make it a little longer, and it'll be reliable for a longer period of time. But we're not seeing that. We're seeing these old plants break more frequently. Here in, in Vermont, Vermont Yankee just sprung five leaks in the condenser just yesterday. Um, it, it turned 40 last month, and then on 40 and one month later, it's got condenser leaks. So Oyster Creek down in New Jersey to the south of you, was just, when it turned 40, it sprung leaks. We seem to forget or choose to forget that as things get old, they break more frequently. And yet the nuclear engineers who operate these plants seem to think they can avoid a fact of nature. They can avoid the bathtub curve. Uh, sooner or later, you've got to hit that other wall and start going back up the unreliability curve. And I think as a nation, we're hitting that. We had a whole bunch more um, um, NRC teams that went out in the field last year than in the years past. And they're all aging-related problems. And the NRC is saying, why is this happening? And they won't ask the question. They won't phrase the question in a way that they get the answer back. My God, these plants are getting old. We should expect it to happen. To round out our domestic United States roundup of nuclear plant operational hazards, what is the latest up in your neck of the woods uh, with Vermont Yankee, the uh, reactor that is modeled after the Fukushima ones? Well, the uh, legislature voted to shut it down, and Entergy sued in federal court, claiming um, that federal preemption laws uh, applied. Um, and um, there are federal preemption laws. The state cannot shut a nuclear plant down on safety reasons. Now, I was on the panel that um, recommended, um, uh, that, well, that was chartered by the, the state of Vermont to look at this, and we, we were not allowed to look at safety. We were allowed to look only at reliability. And in fact, we determined things like this condenser was, were going to leak. We were sure of it, and it was going to be less reliable. But the federal judge um, uh, turned it on its head, and he said, no, reliability was a code word. 
a secret code word. Everybody in Vermont was speaking the secret code, and that um, uh, really when we talked about reliability, we were talking about safety, which was precluded. Now, there's all sorts of uh, important national issues here about what legislatures can talk about that can be overridden by a, by a judge. Um, it was clear the legislature re- wrote into the law of reliability, and the judge is now saying, well, I don't care what you wrote. I believe you meant safety. Um, so it's on appeal. The state of Vermont is appealing, and Entergy is also appealing. They don't think the decision went far enough. Meanwhile, um, Vermont Yankee turned 40 on um, March 22nd and uh, continues to operate and will likely for years. You know, you can hire a lot of lawyers for, for um, uh, you know, probably the hundreds of millions of dollars it would take to repair that plant. So uh, my guess is it'll be tied up in litigation and continuing to operate for three or four years, and at which point Entergy will have made a, hundreds of millions of more even after you deduct out the lawyer's fees. So um, it's unfortunate. I think the will of the people of the state of Vermont has been overridden by a, by a federal judge. And now it's down in your neck of the woods. The, um, the, the uh, New York Circuit Court is, uh, is going to be hearing the case. We're speaking with Arnie Gunderson of Fairwinds Associates. And Arnie, to round out our discussion today, it uh, seems that in Japan, that uh, there are odd circumstances at the even-numbered reactors, in particular units two and four. There are continuing concerns about the structural stability of the spent fuel tank in uh, unit four, and um, uh, hearing that there are um, problems with the radiation levels in unit number two. Can you speak to those and, in fact, the overall condition of Fukushima? Let's start with unit two. Unit two is the one that appears to be intact. It's got the box that's still intact around it. In fact, it had a meltdown, and in fact, it burst the containment, but they stayed inside the box as opposed to blowing the box to smithereens. And what what TEPCO was able to do was to get a crew in there and push a camera with a, a radiation detector down, not into the nuclear reactor, but inside the containment. And they had thought that there would be between 30 and 35 feet of water inside the containment, which would have been a good thing because it would have meant there's enough water to cool um, and, and to shield uh, the core so that people could eventually get inside the containment. Well, they, they got to the 30-foot level and there was no water. They got to the 20-foot level, the 10-foot level. They got down to two feet and they found water. So essentially um, the containment is leaking like a sieve and whatever they're pouring in the top is running out the bottom, and, and uh, the exposure levels were astronomical, um, 7,000 R rem per hour. Now, you die after 1,000, uh, so if you were in there for on the order of 10 minutes, you'd be, you, would, you would immediately die, not some long-term thing, but you would immediately die. Those radiation fields are comparable to what we see in space, and, uh, you know, electronics in space gets fried. So now the question is, well, we can't send a person in, and likely we won't be able to send robots in either because the radiation fields are so bad. So um, Unit 2, um, no one knows how they're ever going to remove the fuel in my lifetime and, and likely for you know, 50, 60, 70 years until eventually some of this radiation decays away. Now, and, and that's the good news. Unit 1 and Unit 3, they can't get into because it's, they're even worse. So um, moving on to Unit 4... Um, Unit 4 doesn't, didn't have any fuel in the reactor, and it blew up for, uh, you know, there's still a scientific debate about why it blew up, but it blew up. And all of the nuclear cores in the fuel pool in the building is structurally severely damaged. Um, Tokyo Electric went in, and one of the very first things they did back last summer when radiation levels were incredibly high was that they put jacks in underneath the pool floor because they were so worried about it cracking. Um, the concern is uh, you've got to get that fuel out. There's enough fuel there. If, it, if the pool were to break from a seismic event or if the building were to topple from a seismic event, now Brookhaven National Labs did a, uh, did a study, uh, almost uh, the identical reactor, and they determined that a fuel pool fire would ensue because the fuel remains physically hot and that the fire would kill tens of thousands of people within a 50-mile range. So... It's the kind of accident, we, if it were to happen, if there were to be a seismic event that uh, either damaged the pool, even more than it's already damaged, or toppled the building, that's like a Richter 7 or a Richter 7-5, something like that. 
if that event occurred, we're right back to March of last year. Uh, you know, it's it's you know you consider about evacuating Tokyo. It's going to be that bad. What about the Humpty Dumpty tank in Unit Four? Uh, yeah. um, I don't think Tokyo Electric has enough money to tackle the problems that it's facing. That's exactly the problem. The spent uh, fuel pool is uh, elevated in a building that uh, some people say is structurally unsound and perhaps even um, slightly off the vertical. Yes, and all the king's horses and all the king's men, if it falls off that wall, it will it, it will crack and the fuel will be exposed to air. And once that happens, uh, there, there there's nothing you can do except let it burn. It will It will mm-hmm. burn in air until it burns out, at which point all of that fuel product, there's enough fuel in that pool that it's almost as much cesium as in all of the atom bombs that were ever dropped in the atmosphere. 800 bombs were dropped in the atmosphere. Well, there's as much cesium in that one pool as those bombs. So, uh, and of course, it, it, it will be local and it will be uh, on the ground, and uh, it, could, it could very easily cut Japan in half. Several Japanese ambassadors, including uh, Akio Matsumura, um, have been pushing the Japanese government to force TEPCO to to treat it like the emergency it is and get that fuel out of that reactor. That's got to be their top um, priority. Our guest is Arnie Gunnison of Fairwinds Associates. He's a nuclear engineer, nuclear plant operator, an expert witness. And Arnie, uh, we are very grateful for this roundup you've given us today. How can people uh, be in touch, follow your work, help uh, Fairwinds, and uh, stay alert in regard to nuclear affairs? Well, the Fairwinds website um, is updated frequently, and that's with an E in the middle, F-A-I-R-E-W-I-N-D-S. Um, Fairwinds website's updated regularly. If you want to get in touch with us, uh, there's a contact button on the site, and if you'd like to make a donation, we're a 501c3. And uh, Maggie and I aren't taking any money for this, but it does. we do have to pay our camera and our web crews and stuff like that. So we would appreciate a donation if anybody can spring for it. Well, thank you. That's fairwinds.org, and that's Arnie Gunderson, and it's uh, once again great to have you with us on 5 O'Clock Shadow, Arnie. Thank you, Robert. Keep up the good work. Thank you. You know, WBAI and Pacifica have a long tradition in the coverage of nuclear affairs and are meetings with remarkable people like Dr. Helen Caldicott, Arnie Gunderson, um, Harvey Wasserman, uh, and uh, so many others, including our own alumnus, the nuclear physicist, Dr. Michio Kaku, and WBAI has on deck a remarkable event uh, that we're asking you to come join us for an extraordinary evening of not only nuclear issues, but uh, wider issues of science, space, and technology from one of the most brilliant people on this planet, Dr. Michio Kaku. We'd like for you to join the Shadow Crew and all of the staff at WBAI at this event on May 7th at the Ethical Culture Society, and here are the details on how you can and should be there. Now, I'm a physicist. We invented the transistor. We helped to invent the first computer. We also invented television. We invented radio. You name it, there was a physicist there. And now, we are inventing the 21st century. On Monday, May 7th, Dr. Michio Kaku, the host of Explorations on Saturdays at 2, will be having a fundraising event for WBAI, where he will be talking about his New York Times best-selling book, Physics of the Future. There will be a reception facilitated by Robert Knight from 6 to 7 p.m., followed by a lecture and a book signing from 7 to 10 p.m. New York Society for Ethical Culture is located at 2 West 64th Street at Central Park West. For more information, go to WBAI.org. You have been listening to 5 O'Clock Shadow on the Pacifica Radio Network with engineering by Michael G. Haskins and production with Tiago Barroso. If you have uh, tips, comments, queries, suggestions, or questions, uh, do drop us an email at theshadow. T-H-E-S-H-A-D-O-W at W-B-A-I dot org and 4 or 5 o'clock shadow. I'm Robert Knight in New York.